tests using uh, using decision analysis in R. Uh, my name is Muhammad. I help out with the NHSR community. A big welcome to all our delegates for joining, uh, and a really warm welcome to uh, to Rob Brown, who's going to be our speaker for um, for this webinar. Um, uh, and just before I hand over to Rob, just to kind of uh, encourage people, if you if you know anybody who's interested in coming to the conference in person, uh, we'd really love to see people come in person uh, and kind of uh, energize the community that way as well. So 16th and 17th of November, there are still some places available. So please do encourage um, anybody you know to actually come and join us uh, at the conference itself. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Rob. And Rob, please do a full introduction where you're from, how you got to R, some of your background, and then tell us more sure. about uh, the content. Thanks very much, Rob. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for uh, attending today. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start off by saying, um, if you notice my accent, uh, I probably have a, from your perspective, a rather strong Southern accent. I am located in the Southeast uh, United States, uh, in the state of Georgia, just a little bit north of Atlanta. And uh, I live very close, uh, uh, in fact, to the base of the, uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains uh, here. Um, anyway, um, let, I guess I will advance to the next slide to answer your question. Um, so my background has mostly been in the field of decision analysis, applications of decision theory. Um, I began my career actually as a mechanical engineer. Um, you know, um, if you really want me to go far back, Muhammad, I, I grew up on a small little farm in middle Georgia, eventually made my way to the city of Atlanta, where I went to Georgia Tech, uh, Georgia Institute of Technology, uh, acquired a, a degree in mechanical engineering. Um, but it wasn't long after, you know, I got out of engineering school, uh, actually spent some time teaching math and physics, you know, then wound up in business. And it didn't take long for me to go from sort of operational engineering to strategic planning. Uh, I was just sort of guided in that direction because it, it, it kind of captured my interest. Um, I think I had grown a little tired of doing what I would call hard engineering. And, and by hard, what I mean is, you know, focused on actually solving problems in the real world or hard physical objects, as opposed to dealing with mostly social systems like strategic planning. Um, but I found the strategic planning just eminently fascinating and dove into, um, I guess, a self-directed study of uh, the things that I didn't get in engineering school and very quickly wound up discovering decision science. Um, so there I, I even, you know, more highly concentrated my efforts. And in that effort, I stumbled on an application uh, called Analytica. Um, and I will, and this was not, this goes back to, you know, to date myself a little bit now, uh, 1996. Um, and I, I became just an avid user of Analytica. And I will admit to you today that I am still an avid user of Analytica. Um, but basically, you know, I, I found a way to sort of meld or mesh the interest that I had in engineering using quantitative approaches to solving problems, system analysis and systems engineering, you know, to those strategic planning questions. And then supporting that, of course, with robust quantitative tools. Analytica became my tool of choice for uh, a, quite a long period of time. And I actually wound up teaching the use of Analytica. Um, but going back to around 2010 uh, or so, um, I, I, get, I became concerned that I was too heavily focused in the use of one tool. And I was afraid that if... Um, if I stayed, you know, only focused there that, you know, if, if the Lumina, the company that makes Analytica, if they were to go out of business, then I would be in trouble. So I kind of pursued understanding, you know, different languages that were available. I mean, I looked at JavaScript. Of course, I had Fortran in uh, university um, and um, uh, I, just, I discovered R. A friend of mine said, you need to check out R. So I started looking into using R for analysis as well. And uh, as a test case, I developed what ultimately became uh, the book that I wrote, uh, Business Case Analysis with R, uh, as a little presentation for one of the local user groups in Atlanta. And it was after that presentation that somebody came to me and um, said, 
you know, this was really a fascinating use of R. We've never seen anybody really do business case analysis with R because most people use spreadsheets. And quite frankly, you know, I abhor spreadsheets, which I explain in the book uh, as to why that's the case. But, um, um, you know, they encouraged me to actually take a 14 page presentation and convert that into something a little bit more uh, in depth and uh, translatable to people, you know, to help them use R in more extended ways, uh, I would say. So that was the genesis of writing that little book. And then I wrote three other small monographs that went with it. And uh, so then in 2018, um, actually at the end of 2017, uh, Springer Nature approached me and asked me if I would be interested in turning over the publishing rights to them. Uh, so they bought the publishing rights. And then we we merged those four books together into business case analysis with R as a single uh, uh, book and published that in the spring of 2018. So it's, you know, the book is about uh, four years old now. And um, I guess I could advance to that slide that mentions it. It's available at all uh, fine outlets, uh, you know, where you might want to try to buy it. However, um, I'll, I'll point out to the group, uh, I've made this uh, the ebook version of the of the book available to everybody that attends today. So if you will reach out to Muhammad, Muhammad is going to uh, share uh, both the slide presentation, uh, a copy of the book, as well as the source code that I will step us through in just a moment. Um, so I guess that kind of takes me to where we are now. Uh, I will say, though, that as we move into uh, the discussion later on today um, or at, at, over the next hour here, um, my thinking about how certain things are done well has sort of evolved a bit. So the way things are presented in the book are probably a little bit you know, dated now to the way that I might approach them. I think it still holds up. Um, but uh, you will notice, I think, some differences between the approach I take today and the approach that I take in the book. They're not wildly different, but they are. There are some divergences. Um, maybe before I move on from there, uh, maybe I would ask if there are any sort of questions uh, to the audience before I I step ahead. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, either raise your hand or put it in the chat, and. Um, uh, and also, Rob, people are applauding the fact that you've offered your PD, your ebook. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I mean, I, I mean, it's really good if you have difficulty sleeping. Um, so you, you want to sit down and start reading it. You will go to sleep rather quickly. I promise you. Uh, but uh, just, um, one of the we will send out an evaluation form. The, po the point is not uh, to, to really to highlight to people that. Um, what what the, what delegates have to say is really important to us, but especially on this topic, because business case analysis in the National Health Service is 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 done in a very rudimentary way, I think. And so okay. uh, we want to hear from uh, people about what they think about the webinar, whether we might do more on this, but also your, your ideas of of how you might take this further. So I'll put the link in towards the end of the session. But the whole discipline of decision analysis and what we do with it in the National Health Service, I think we've got a, we've got a kind of a double whammy with Rob today, really, uh, not just R, but also decision analysis. So, uh, Rob, I'll, help, I'll hand back to you. Thank you. OK, sure. So um, I, actually, then before I go in a little bit further, then let me note that, of course, I would say most of my career, 90 percent of my career has been focused primarily on commercial type questions, commercial endeavors. I have done a bit of both public and quasi-public private uh, initiatives. Um, I don't know ex exactly ultimately how the NHS is really organized. I, I must confess my ignorance on that. So I'm going to assume it's just a pure public um, service. Uh, I don't know if you if you do receive private contributions to that. However, what I'll talk about today will sort of be from the point of view of a quasi-public-private type integrated uh, analysis. Uh, I think you should be able to extend it uh, to whatever needs you have. Uh, but I'll talk about it from that perspective simply because that's really the experience that I have. Um, but anyway, so let's let me start off by just sort of 
answering the question by what we mean by decision analysis. And I would point out that, you know, you know, life is actually full of problems, right? That is, we we find ourselves in states, uh, not necessarily disastrous uh, situations or unfortunate situations, but we find ourselves often in states where uh, we find out that there's another alternative condition that's better than the one we in, than the one we are currently in. Uh, as a result of that, we start to think about how can we move from a an undesirable state to a more desirable state, and so we establish goals to achieve, uh, to measure whether or not we've moved from that undesirable to the more desirable state. And in order to get there, of course, we must make decisions. And by a decision, um, I will always mean an irreversible allocation of resource for the purpose of achieving some goal. Um, now. When I say irreversible, you might be thinking to yourself, well, is that really always true? I mean, for example, if I spend money to achieve something uh, and then I ask for my money back and I do get my money back, say, you know, you go and buy something. Have I not returned myself to the original position by getting the money back I've I've spent? And the answer to that is still no. And the reason for that is that whatever money you spent during that period of time that it was out of your pocket, that money could have been used for something else and time has passed. I mean, so you're never really returning to any original state that you were in, in the process of making decisions. So a decision always involves an irreversible allocation of some resource, whether it's time or money or uh, the use of people, uh, hard capital, all of those things. Uh, they have some bearing on the world that cannot be returned back to their original state. Um, in engineering, of course, we sort of call this entropy uh, or uh, ergodicity, non-ergodicity. Um, um, the other thing, of course, that's very uh, problematic in life is that we face uncertainties. That is uncontrollable events that often cause uh, the decisions that we make to deviate from the goals that we're able to achieve. So uncertainties are actually the sources of risk. Um, that in risk being uh, that likelihood or that uh, eventuality that we wouldn't achieve the goals that we want. All of these sort of things are working together when we make decisions. Decision analysis is that normative guidance uh, for the best known ways to achieve goals through irreversible allocation of resources, that is through decisions, especially when the confidence in those outcomes are uncertain. Uh, so that's basically what we'll be going talking through today is how to make a sort of a specific quantitative application of decision analysis. I, I want to emphasize it will be very high level, though. Uh, and uh, certainly I would encourage you if you, again, I'll make a little plug from my book, but the one that you will receive for free, um, it's, you, you can certainly spend a little bit more time in the book itself uh, to get to gain more insights into deeper levels of the things we'll talk about today. Um, unfortunately, though, I think over the last few years, um, people seem to have missed the guidance that's available through decision analysis and decision theory. And as a result of really very poor decision making skills um, or poor decision making applications, uh, people have adopted the idea that the big problem with this is, of course, people just flying by the seat of their pants or people just, you know, using only their gut instincts to make decisions. And so they've addressed that with with something that you're I'm sure you've heard described as data driven decision making. Um, I think this has actually uh, introduced another problem in itself as well. Um, that is, is that the reason human beings make decisions is to achieve goals uh, that you know satisfy certain pra preferences and values uh, that only humans have. And so really what I suggest to people is that we should be making decisions that are values focused, but data supported. Um, the data-driven decision making movement, I'm afraid though, uh, for those of us that you know have been involved in data analysis, um, is that it has, I think taking our eyes off of that essential reason why we make decisions. And we've adopted the idea, I think, or the practice, uh, even if it's just sort of a tacit assumption uh, involved in the process, that all we need to make better decisions is more data and better data. 
And I don't think this could actually be further from the truth. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm suggesting here. That is not that we don't need better data to support good decision making. We absolutely do. And I will never suggest that we don't. But what we've taken our minds off is those goals and objectives that we have um, when we make decisions and making sure that we have that right, because the failure to do that correctly leads us into what I would call a type three error, right? In other words, we're not just determining whether we've made a false positive or we've identified a false positive or a false negative. We've actually solved for the wrong null hypothesis altogether. Um, that is a real problem. And uh, the result of all of this that has happened over the last maybe even decade now that sort of data science has become so prevalent is that the failure rate, uh, and this is maybe a little bit dated in terms of its um, uh, history now, but the failure rate, according to Gartner in 2016, of decision analysis or data analysis projects was on the order of 85 percent. Uh, and the largest reason for that was going back specifically to these type three errors. People are not necessarily solving the right problem for the right reasons. Uh, they're doing a lot of really good, what I call science fair projects. Um, and no doubt we have made some significant strides in understanding how to do these things better. But the problem is we're not doing them better on the right types of problems. Um, we're not solving relevant problems uh, in many cases, um, much more often than you might think. So I guess the next question is, how do we get out of that? How do we frame a good, uh, how do we frame a decision problem correctly? And then ultimately, uh, I think is we'll see how do we get this down to a, a level that the, the tools that we have in the field of data science actually serve it well. Um, so very high level. The thing that we need to do, first of all, is identify, as I've already mentioned, the goals and objectives and the anticipated value trade-offs that we might face when we make a decision. I cannot emphasize how important this is, and uh, I don't have it noted here, um, but please write this down. Uh, there is a book that you can uh, called Value Focused Thinking by Ralph Keeney. It is absolutely one of the best books on this subject. Uh, I tell people all the time, if you do not have this on your library shelf, you really haven't studied the field of decision making uh, to its proper depth. Um, but it is so important to get that part right. This is the part where you make sure you don't solve or achieve a type three error. Now, moving on from there, of course, we need to identify the right decisions. What are the right relevant decisions that we could make? And very often these decisions um, we might uh, identify a set of decisions, but those decisions often have to be coordinated together in such a way to create what I call a decision strategy. So uh, we need to identify the decisions because in order to accomplish a, um, I guess, a fully informed decision analysis, we need to make comparisons between different ways of doing things. In other words, we need to do proper uh, com uh, competitive cost analysis. Um, the next thing, of course, we need to identify are the material uncertainties that could affect us. Um, very often, these material uncertainties may present themselves conditionally different uh, on the decision strategy that might be exercised. So um, as we go through the process of identifying these uncertainties, typically you may have to identify uh, as many uncertainties as, um, well, and assess their value you may have to identify as many as the number of uncertainties times the number of decision strategies you have. So this, unfortunately, is one of the sources of the complexities that arise in good decision analysis is that the conditional uncertainties often proliferate um, very quickly. Uh, the last thing that I actually always recommend to folks uh, when they go through this process is not just to keep track of all of this information, you know, items one, two, and three in a list somewhere, but to actually map it out in the form of an influence diagram. And I'm going to present an influence diagram for a little case study that we're going to look at in this uh, discussion today. Um, but the influence diagram becomes sort of the de facto standard for how you communicate the essence of the decision problem. Uh, it is the, the abstraction of the problem at hand, uh, and it gives you a map 
a functional map of how decisions relate through conditional uncertainties, ultimately to affect the objective uh, or the value that you're trying to achieve. Uh, again, I cannot overemphasize the value of creating a good influence diagram. Um, all right, so that's high level. Uh, and again, it, this could be explored into many, many levels uh, and, and certainly uh, it has over the course of the last 50 years or so in the development of uh, decision theory and decision analysis. Uh, I'm going to take this now to a little bit more specific focus, of course, because I think you're all probably here to see how we do this maybe in R, or how the use of the R programming language supports this. Um, so. Oh, and, and actually, let me do take a, a moment just to stop again and make sure I'm not just, you know, spewing rapidly and just uh, not giving people an opportunity to ask questions or to uh, ask me to clarify something. So I'll pause just a moment and ask if there are any sort of questions that might exist. Uh... In the chat, Rob. Okay, well, good. Well, maybe not so good, <laughs> um, but but good. I'll I'll move on again. So again, um, the very first thing in in order to transform then a business case analysis problem uh, into a form that you can address with R. Again, I emphasize build an influence diagram. Let that be the sort of the guide uh, for how you build your model in R. Uh, when you identify those key material uncertainties, uh, you will need to identify proper subject matter experts to assess those uncertainties and to assess them conditionally on the decisions that are being made. Um, I'll just real quickly uh, comment that a subject matter expert is a person who can give you fine-grained explanations for why things vary, those things that are of concern to them, right? why you've identified them as a subject matter expert. You do not necessarily go to a person who's a subject matter expert because they can make a, a very precise forecast. Uh, in fact, what we'll do initially is to avoid precision and focus more on accuracy. But what you really want to know from, an uh, from a subject matter expert is, can they explain in fine grained detail why systems or the, uh, the variable that you've asked them to assess with you, why that thing can vary? Um, the next thing we would do is with the understanding that the, uh, the subject matter experts have given us about the variation of the uncertainties, as well as combined with the flow of the influence diagram, we need to now transform this into a business model function. And I want to emphasize the word function here because in the R code, uh, we are going to create a function that we call repeatedly over a number of trials in Monte Carlo simulation. But in order to do that and to do that well um, and to do some other ancillary or uh, extended analysis, uh, it's always good to have everything built into a base unit function uh, that you can repeatedly call. Uh, the next thing we'll do, of course, is simulate the uncertainties uh, from the subject matter experts. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we get from those subject matter experts in a minute so that we can uh, so that we can simulate them. Uh, but uh, let me point out in, that from the experts, you need to start off at least if you don't have good supporting data that has a, um, uh, I guess, a strong pedigree behind it. That is, you know where the data came from, how it was collected, when it was collected, what were the conditions under which it was collected, all that, uh, those sort of things that speak to high quality data collection. Um, from the subject matter expert, you will want to collect P105090 inputs. Again, I'm going to discuss about uh, this in just a little bit. Those P105090 inputs become parameters for the simulation. Um, then we will um, generate important insights. Actually, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll run the, sim model, the variable simulations through the model function uh, to then uh, model the, the effect on the key value metric that we've identified. Uh, and then we'll generate some insights on some important outcomes. Another key issue is that the R code should allow us to perform some sensitivity analysis on that key objective function, sensitivity to variations in the uncertainties themselves. Finally, uh, we'll want to evaluate something called value of information. 
uh, on critical uncertainties. Again, I will explain what these mean in a little bit more detail. Um, but the value of information, just to sort of give you a, um, uh, uh, I guess, a heads up as to what's coming with that, is that it helps you to set a research budget for doing actual data analysis. Um, so this is part of the way in which we bring the decision analysis together with the data analysis. Uh, again, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. And then finally, I would actually encourage the use of reproducible code uh, in the form of uh, markdown files so that your uh, the business case rationale can be easily uh, distributed to other stakeholders that would benefit uh, or and consume your analysis. Uh, I won't necessarily go into number nine uh, today, um, but certainly, you know, our uh, Quarto, uh, the our shiny environment in Quarto have created some really amazing user interfaces and user experiences um, to make uh, documents of this sort uh, easily transmittable. All right, so I've kind of laid out all the groundwork, uh, I think, here. So let's look now at maybe uh, a, a little case study that we can walk through today to sort of demonstrate some of the ideas that I've uh, uh, sort of introduced. So the first thing is, in this particular um, uh, case study, uh, we'll consider a therapeutic technology combined with a service. Uh, that is invested, that the or that an organization is invested in, a, maybe some sort of a healthcare organization like the NHS, or something more like a a public private uh, type operation like a hospital here in the United States. Um, I don't know uh, if you're familiar with the way things are operated here in the U.S. We don't have a national healthcare system uh, quite like you do. Uh, we do have federally and state supported health operations. Um, and certainly benefits that people can acquire. But for the most part, hospitals here are either purely private or else they are a combination of private public enterprises. Um, and so in, in that uh, perspective, they very often are run from the point of view of a business. Um, good or bad, that's the way it is. Um, so the case study here that I'll demonstrate is sort of from that point of view of a, of a, a kind of a quasi public private enterprise. Um, so the, the, this in, uh, therapeutic technology that could be brought to bear in the uh, market or the uh, service to population. And by the way, again, I'll, I'll make note that if I say the word market, uh, I know maybe for you, that might not seem quite right, but I, I do mean the population of people that would be benefited by whatever decisions are being made, um, whether they're an actual market or not. Um, so anyway, this new therapeutic technology, there's potentially a couple of different ways to go about implementing that technology. Um, decision two operates at a lower cost of delivery. It achieves a larger addressable population, and it does so faster than, say, decision one. However, that technology, what the differences in those technology are, how they manifest themselves, this is the way so it works out in the in real life. The one of the biggest trade-offs though that we have to face is that decision two, though, cost one and a half times more. Um, and as a result of the benefits that it creates, you know, its lower cost of operation or whatever. Um, the uh, the governing bodies that deliver uh, sort of the public funds to make this work, uh, they might offer a, a slightly lower capitation rate uh, uh, to the hospital or to the health system for delivering that. And the capitation rate, I, what I mean in, in this case is, you know, that per person or the per unit uh, subsidy that they would receive uh, every time the, uh, the therapeutic technology is used or put into use. So, of course, then the question would be, if I make the decision, technology one or variation on technology one with technology two, if I make a choice between those decisions, what are the various trade-offs and value that I might experience in order to get to what ultimately would be a, uh, a sizable or an appreciable social benefit uh, to the service population? All right. So uh, as I look at the influence diagram, uh, we've identified, of course, initially, uh, well, actually, let me 
come down here. We've identified the objective measure that we'll use as the primary objective measure. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the only thing that we value. Uh, but that objective measure in this particular case will be the net present value of the future cash flows that are generated from this, again, public-private uh, enterprise. Um, you might not use net present value in the NHS, uh, although I, I suspect you might have to use some variation on it. And I'll talk a little bit about how we can address that in a little bit. But for right now, we're going to look at the cash flows that are generated. Uh, and we will then calculate the net present value or the time adjusted um, or time value of money adjusted uh, sum of all the cash flows over time. Um, we've already identified the two decision strategies. So we have identified our objective. We've identified the strategies or the decisions that need to be made. Now we've also identified uh, the uncertainties uh, that might uh, frustrate our ability to create value. So one of the first the key uncertainties would be how much will that initial investment really cost us? Um, as you know, people are given budgets all the time and budgets are very frequently overrun. A few times we might actually be short budget, but for the most part, people tend to overrun their budgets. Um, so there's always an uncertainty associated, associated with some sort of initial investment. Uh, the fixed cost, of course, might not be thoroughly known and understood, but we could probably begin to uh, uh, anticipate what those might be. The same thing for the unit cost of delivery. How much will it actually cost us to service uh, a particular use uh, of the technology? Another issue that we might think about is how long does it take us to go from our initial inception of the technology for its use in the population to when it reaches a maybe a peak usage rate and then what that actual peak usage rate would be. So we know it's probably going to at least do one of uh, three things, right? It'll probably either start off slow and ramp up to a peak. It might go linearly or it could start off fast and then reach a peak and, and flatten out. It could even begin to grow to some degree. Um, for this model, as you'll see in a bit, I'm going to assume that it's going to operate more like a saturation function, right? Where it starts off slow, like an S-curve, and then grows up to a peak. But we don't know what that peak usage is. We don't know how long it takes to get to peak. Ultimately, we don't know what the capitation rate is, um, you know, the analog to the price point that we would be able to charge. So this might also be an uncertainty as well. And then finally, um, maybe the SGNA rate, or that is sales general and admin, or more generically uh, described, the overhead uh, level of cost that would be associated. So you'll notice all of these uncertainties are operating through a sort of a flow of causality. The time to peak, the peak users ultimately affects a calculation for the adoption of the technology in the usage population. Uh, that adoption affects the subsidy that we're able to accrue, the benefit internally. Um, the cost of delivery is also a function uh, of the adoption itself through the unit cost of delivery. Um, and then, of course, the initial investment um, uh, itself has the depreciation associated with it. The initial investment um, also affects the initial cash flow, but the depreciation affects ultimately maybe the tax burden that we're assessed. So all of these uh, elements converge on a cash flow um, that we ultimately then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, convert into some sort of net present value over time. All right, let me pause there because I, I think I, I went through a lot and just asked, are there any questions maybe about what we're setting up here with this uh, particular uh, case study? Uh, well, but um, so um, what's the relationship between an influence diagram and a decision tree? Because my instincts would have been to draw out a decision tree. They're, they're actually analogs of each other. Um, the problem with the decision tree, though, is that if as you develop more and more complexity in the underlying causal relationships between input and output, the decision trees become very complex to deal with. Right, you go from a decision tree to something like a decision bush, <laughs> you know, um, and they just become very difficult to deal with. So this is a simple example, and you probably could um, maybe reflect a lot of this into a decision tree. But 
decision trees and influence diagrams are just analogs of each other. Okay, sure. All right, now, the next question, of course, that we need to answer would be, now that we've identified the sort of the causal relationship between our input decisions, uh, how they conditionally affect the uncertainties that we would be facing. Um, and, and let me actually make a comment on this. Of course, when I say conditionally affect, I'm not necessarily saying that the decision itself causes the variation, but it exposes us to an opportunity for the variable to express itself differently. Right. So we can think of this as counterfactual analysis um, under a different set of facts. How might this variable behave? And those facts are determined by the decisions that we make. Um, that's what I mean by the conditional relationship. Um, and then, of course, as it flows through, the next thing we need to understand, of course, for these conditional uh, uncertainties, how we get the information for those at least to initialize our analysis. And this gets back to one of the original problems I pointed out with sort of data-driven uh, decision-making is that very often we don't have the data to support a strategic decision-making opportunity. Uh, strategically, uh, strategic decisions are, by definition, something new to the world. Um, many of the conditions that we are hoping to uh, implement have never existed before. So we don't really have relevant data for it. And so therefore we don't, not only do we have not have relevant data, but we also don't have a lot of data. I mean, none at all, right? So we have to have a way to construct this information to start off with. And we will do that through the use of subject matter experts. Um, I'm not gonna expend a whole lot of time on this slide per se, but I do wanna point out that what we will do with a subject matter expert is to, first of all, make sure that they understand the, uh, the uncertainty that we're asking them to assess very clearly using the clarity test. And in the presentation material, I've got a link here um, that you could follow and, and find out more clearly <laughs> what the clarity test actually means. But um, essentially, you just want to make sure that the uncertainty is defined so well that both you and the uh, subject matter expert don't have a disagreement or there is no misunderstanding about what is meant. Um, the next thing you will want the subject matter expert to do, of course, is to think about, bring to bear their expertise on what describes extrema, the high and the low values for each uncertainty, again, given the particular decision uh, point that you're on. Um, it's very important to go through this process first because you want to de-bias your subject matter expert uh, from just simply picking numbers out of their, their mind that they are maybe most familiar with or have been influenced by recently. Um, so in other words, you want to control for availability bias or recency bias, um, various selection biases. There's a whole menagerie of biases that we may want to control for, but we begin that process of controlling for those biases by getting them to think about the causes of variation. Once we have asked them to think about those causes and we've documented those causes, then we ask them to think about the not so or not nearly so extreme points the, that they could imagine, right? Not the very worst case or the very best case, but something a little bit less. And that would be the P10, 50, 90 values, or another way to think about it, ask them to think about an 80th percentile prediction interval. In other words, if they had to think about the future and where this variable would fall out in terms of its real value, what range would they estimate such that they would be 80% sure that the actual value would fall in that range? Now, it's very important that when we do this process that we don't start with the P50 and add some padding to it. Essentially, that process leads to a bias called anchoring and then adjustment. Um, this uh, almost always leads to too narrow of, a, of an uncertainty range. So we want to start our experts at thinking about the endpoints, the P10 and the P90 first. Ask them to give us a number for which they are 90% sure that the actual value would fall outside that range, or I'm sorry, 10% uh, chance that that actual value would fall outside that range. And by the way, there, there's a section of my book that actually helps you to work through this process with a, a subject matter expert. Um, and then do the P50 last. The P50, of course, is the median value. It's the number at which they think there's a 50-50 chance that the actual value could be higher or lower. 
And then finally, what we want to do is uh, get the expert to think as broadly as possible, at least initially, uh, so that they're not too narrow in their focus and we're not caught, you know, uh, blindsided by uh, uh, events that tricked us into thinking that we have better precision than we actually uh, are warranted in having. So that would be the process for getting this information. And what we would want to do, of course, is to capture that information into a table um, according to those parameters that we just described. And so this is uh, an example of those variables that we looked at on the influence diagram now translated into the parameters of the uncertainty distributions that we'll use in the analysis. Um, and we will do this according to uh, a low bound, an upper bound, and then the P101590s in between, right? You'll also notice, and this is very important to keep in mind, that these numbers must be monotonically increasing. In other words, they must go from a low value to a high value in this order. But in the end, they, they reflect the best estimate from your subject matter expert for their 80th percentile prediction interval on these variables. And again, notice that they are, they differ conditionally uh, on the decision, right? All right, a lot of setup here. Let's watch ours do some tricks. All right, before we get started on that, um, I do want to point out just some uh, good housekeeping. I tend to keep my R project sort of separated into at least uh, four different files uh, or four file types. Uh, the first is that I would have a model that actually runs the business case analysis itself. But I want to separate from that model uh, another file that contains the callable functions that I might need to use that are specific to this case. So I, uh, I keep various packages or um, you know, other uh, function sets separate that I can use in other places. And that's also important because in the development of a model, sometimes you'll realize, oh, I need this function. I'll put it in my function file and I can use that in other places. Um, another file that I tend to separate out from the overall business model itself are the global assumptions. Uh, these are, uh, as we'll see in just a second, these are uh, specific values of interest as well as various lists that might need to be used over and over and over again throughout the model. Um, and it gives me one good solid location where I can change those or keep them uh, fixed and then do variations on the business model itself if I need to. But these would be these would remain more or less constants throughout any sort of analysis. And then, of course, any sort of data files that you might need, maybe in the form of uh, CSV type files. Um, all right. I know you're all sort of anticipating jumping into some R, so we're going to do that now. Um, so here's the sort of setup. As you can see, I've created a um, uh, a project. And within that project, I've created the, the various files I've just described. The one difference being here for today's conversation, instead of having CSV files to store that data frame that I just uh, displayed for the uncertainties, I've actually just sort of manually coded uh, those uncertainties here um, just real quickly uh, so that it'll we don't necessarily have to worry about data importing and things like that. We can focus on just the business model behavior. Uh, but you'll notice here I've created uh, at the top where I bring in my libraries, I source in my global uh, functions or my functions and my global values. Um, my global values um, are in this file. Uh, and this is where I define things like how many trials I'll run on the Monte Carlo simulation. I, I define the time horizon that I'll be using. In this particular case, it'll be 10 years. Uh, and I create an index or a list for that time. And you'll notice that while the, the model runs over a 10-year horizon, um, I've set it up so that it runs in increments of months. So in fact, I can go ahead and I'll just run this. Oops. Uh, and if I come down to the... Um, the console you can see uh, how this operates out, right? So the year index uh, are, are actually in monthly units. Um, you know, other constants to take note of, the depreciation period, 
uh, my tax rate, my weighted average cost of capital, which your finance group should be able to supply this if you're a you know a public entity. Uh, I'm sorry, a private entity. Uh, this is the time rate of uh, value, your cost of capital uh, that is determined through the capital asset pricing model. Uh, you may, in a situation like for the NHS, uh, not use a discount rate that's uh, you know uh, typically generated from a um, a polynomial series. You might use something more like hyperbolic discounting. It, something to look up, but hyperbolic discounting still sort of retains the idea of the time value of money, but uh, it emphasizes future cost and benefits a little bit more than uh, typical polynomial discounting. Uh, and then, of course, I've got some lists uh, of things that I might use repeatedly over through the model. All right, so then next, so if I run these uncertainties, uh, in, in their value creation. Uh, uh, let me see here. So they tell you never run live R code and I'm, I'm hoping I'm not gonna embarrass myself here. But this is what, you know, those uh, uncertainties would look like in a table, right? So I've, I, I've taken the sort of the manually created version of these uncertainties. I've put them now into a list of uh, data frames. The list is organized by the decision that we're making. Uh, the variables are organized in their rows by the parameters of the uncertainty, the distribution of the uncertainty. The next thing, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, is that I would want to create a model that translates the influence diagram into a function. So the investment model uh, looks basically takes this form. It, it's an analog. Um, a procedural analog of the influence diagram. So you'll notice the investment value here is calculated in the first year or the first time period. Um, the adoption curve is generated here. And you'll notice that here I'm calling a function called ramp up, which is contained in my function file. Uh, and basically this generates an S curve ramp up. It's a solution to the partial or the differential equation associated with um, uh, a consumption type model. And then of course the subsidy calculates the benefit that I receive for use of the technology, the cost of delivery, the fixed cost, the SGA, the depreciation, ultimately the gross profit, which is the subsidy minus that cost of delivery, my net profit, which is gross profit, less fixed cost, less general and admin, less depreciation. And this gives me the uh, the cash or rather the profit uh, consideration that then allows me to calculate my tax burden. I then net the tax burden against that net profit to get net operating profit after tax uh, by adding back in the depreciation. Uh, remember, depreciation is not an actual cash flow. It's merely a tax shield that we use to calculate this. And so the NOPAT I will use to understand what my cash flows look like after the investment. Uh, but then we'll also need to understand what the cash flows look like over time, particularly the cumulative cash flow um, by subtracting out the investment itself. Now, even though I've got a plus here, remember I made the investment negative uh, at the top. Finally, a key point is that all of these calculations I am going to put into a table, a results table, that I can then draw from to do other analysis. So the whole model will run. It will capture all of the results into this one table, and then I can pull values out of that table on its return uh, to do other uh, types of calculations. Uh, notice that the parameter that's required for this function, uh, it's just simply V, but V is a vector of all of the inputs uh, or that uh, are the, um, the values that come from the simulation for each variable on each trial. Uh, so to see what that looks like again, I'm going to take these inputs, I'm going to now run them. I, oops, you know what I did? I forgot to run the top. 
So I need to run all of these. And there we go. Not a total disaster. All right, so now when I run, if I want to get an idea of what the uncertainty sims looks like, again, this is a table that has converted the input list of data frames into now um, a list of trial values from the simulation. And I'm only going to look at the first decision. Um, and then, in fact, I'll just I'll take the head of that. And you can see what this looks like now. So for each one of those variables, I now have a list of trial values that are returned from the Monte Carlo simulation. And this list is actually 20,000 elements long for this particular decision, for the decision one case. And then I'm going to take this each row and I'm going to run each row through as a vector into my business uh, function. Uh, in this particular uh, location here. So I call the business function here. I slice out each row of the simulation trial values for each decision. And then I store them in that table and I call them. And I'll call them for other uses, right? So I'm going to run that. Oh, caramba, what in the world? All right. Well, again, here we go. All right, so now um, I've run the model. I now have a large table, actually a list of tables uh, that contains uh, about a half a gigabyte of information. And if I run that, you can see what this will look like. So I can just simply do a, uh, a toggle on that, that table. It would be probably a little bit more in, uh, informative if I... Um, yeah. Just do a slice to give you an idea. So again, I'm going to look at the, the first decision. And then I'm going to look at um, variable number two. Uh, this will be variable number one was the um, the investment. So it won't be that informative since it's just one value in the first year. And I'll look at the very first trial. So variable two is actually the adoption curve. And you can see the that what I've sliced out for decision one is the adoption curve. And it gets me uh, for trial number one. There are 20,000 more of these for decision one, of course, 20,000 more of these for decision two. All right, now, now that I've run the sort of the simulation, I'm ready to do some sort of deeper analysis into the implications of all of the uncertainties on the decisions that we've made with these two different technologies. So one of the things I might wanna look at would be the adoption curve. What does that actually look like in time? that will return a plot that looks like this. So uh, adoption, decision number one is showing us that we reach up to a sort of a stable uh, number of uh, services per, uh, per month of about 20 services a month. Decision two gets us up to about uh, 40 service applications per month. And you might be thinking right now, oh, well, this clearly shows that decision two is better than decision one because I'm able to help more people um, actually help more people at a faster rate. Now, that may or may not be the case in the end, but we'll look. Maybe the next thing we would want to pull out of that uh, decision table, or rather the uh, simulation table that we ran, the business model results, would be a calculation of the cash flow in terms of the net operating profit after tax. So if I run this particular curve, uh, you'll now see that I get the cash flow curve, uh, well, net operating profit after tax, which is actually real cash flow. And so what this is showing is that each decision is ramping up in terms of the net cash it's generating, but then it reaches the point at which it exhausts its depreciation period. We no longer get the tax benefit, and um, that comes to an end, and so we get a reduced net, op net operating profit after about uh, seven years. 
which is exactly where it should be since that's the way we defined it in our global um, our global uh, parameters. Um, the next thing that we would, might want to look at uh, would be helpful would be the cumulative cash flow. So this will help us understand where we get payback on our investment. And so this particular uh, chart is showing us that uh, decision two actually, as we suspect, has a much larger drawdown initially in cash. It starts to pay back faster because it's getting to market faster and it has a larger population that it's drawing from, even though it has a lower capitation rate than decision one. Decision one actually never fully reaches within a 10 year horizon, uh, a break even perspective, but decision two does after about, uh, let's say, eight years or so. So that's an important thing to understand. We also exceed or incrementally exceed the, the cash generated by decision one um, along the years, uh, about year six. Uh, so these are some important insights that would help us to understand, you know, what's going on in the overall business case. All right, so the, the thing that we really need to focus on next would be what is the overall net present value? So I can go back to this cash flow. Um, with the investment included in it, apply a discount rate to account for the time value of the money involved, sum all of that back to year one, to the first time period, and then get a curve that includes all of those uh, uncertainties uh, in the form of a, uh, a cumulative probability distribution. Now I'm going to zoom in on this curve. Oops, where did it go? Well, maybe I won't zoom in on it. I know it's got to be in there somewhere. Um, but you'll notice that this curve actually uh, is another way of looking into some of the trade-offs that would uh, need to be considered. So for example, right away, we can look at the mean values of both of these uh, two curves. The mean values are indicated by the vertical lines. Um, the vertical red line shows us that these and the green line are showing that, that these two decisions are both by themselves not going to create a socially valuable uh, net positive result. But that being said, you may still have to invest in this technology. There may be some reason why this is required, maybe by your, your government or, or whatever. But if you do, the decision two ekes out a little bit more incremental value than decision one you might still decide to go ahead with that. Another thing that is sort of demonstrated here is that we face a dilemma since typical uh, finance theory tells us that we should invest in projects that have higher mean net present value and less risk. But decision two is showing us that while it has a higher net present value, it actually exposes us to a greater level of risk. And that's not surprising since the fact is that we, it costs more to implement um, but it also has a higher upside potential. So this is something that is interesting to know. And we might think to ourselves, well, how could we control a situation where we get more upside potential rather than less? And I'll run through one last thing here. Um, and that would be the uncertainty analysis uh, that gives us the tornado plot or what we call a tornado plot. And the tornado analysis is going to give us a chart that shows us the effect on that mean value of each of these decisions when each of the uncertainties are sequentially moved through their high and low values. Now, it'll take a little while to run. Um, we'll just sort of let it go through its little machinations here. I'll take a sip of coffee. And we get this chart. So uh, what this chart is showing us, the vertical lines are the mean values of each of the decisions from the cumulative probability chart that we just looked at. The bars are the range of that net present value that results when a specific uncertainty moves through its high and its low value. And what we want to look for are the variables that significantly overlap. 
And what that overlap will tell us is that if we were to invest in the decision that gives us the highest average or expected net present value, we would potentially face regret due to the effect of this particular uncertainty for not having chosen the next best decision. So um, I think I've just now run out of time. I'm not going to go into it, but uh, it's in the code. And it's also in the the uh, a description of the uh, today's presentation, as well as it's, it's in my book. There's a much deeper explanation. We would conduct value of information on these variables to understand how to set a budget to do a deeper data analysis or let's say um, market analysis uh, to get a better understanding of what that range might be so that we can have a less ambiguous choice before us once we make um, before we go ahead with an actual investment decision. In fact, the two uh, really critical uncertainties, of course, are what does the market really bear in terms of how many people might actually adopt the use of the technology or be affected by the technology from a therapeutic perspective? And then finally, or in also, how much will it actually cost us to invest and actually get the technology as a service up and running? So I think I'll bring it to a close there. <laughs> Can I make a suggestion, Rob? Because this is being recorded, and it is fascinating, by the way, really interesting, and uh, there's some interesting questions already uh, in the chat. Um, I wonder if you're comfortable, would you would you mind kind of finishing off the the next segment? Uh, I know some some people will have to go because we're scheduled sure. for an hour, but they can always come back and re and look at the recording again. So, um, okay, kind of, is that okay? I, if you don't mind, I think that would be great. Oh, I, I've got the time. I just want to be respectful of your uh, attendees' time. So, yeah, I can continue on, and I don't think it'll um, take me much longer. Great. Thank you, Rob. All right. So that value of information, how do we calculate it? So the first thing that we'd want to do is identify which critical uncertainty we want to assess or we want to attest for the value of information. The investment uh, bar is at the top. Um this might be one of the very first things we would look at because it has the widest range and the potential, the widest potential for overlap between the two variables. Um, you, I think it's actually really a toss up really between initial investment and peak uses. The reason for that is that while the initial investment has that wider impact, it's something that's more within your control. You could go back to the group of people that are responsible for developing the investment analysis. Most likely these are internal, uh, or you can develop some other strategies about how that investment could take place. The thing that's really outside your control, though, is the number of people that would ultimately be affected or could use the technology. Um, this is the one that would really cause you to either create positive social value or um, could cause the value to actually be about twice as um, at risk than what you would uh, face right now. Um, the way we go through this is that, first of all, uh, I'm going to consider uh, or think back on this as if it were a decision tree. Now, what we've done so far is we've solved the decision tree even though we haven't looked at a decision tree so uh, specifically, but we've solved the decision tree and found the decision that maximizes decision value. That decision that maximizes the expected decision value, of course, is decision two because it has the highest mean value. But now I want to know what is the decision that I would make if I knew the outcome of that particular uncertainty that I'm concerned about first? on the net present value. In other words, if I could go back and reverse my decision tree such that instead of making the decision and then experiencing the uncertainties, what if I could experience the uncertainties and then make the decision? That way, in other words, I would know beforehand as if I were a clairvoyant what to do uh, to maximize my value. The way we would do this is that we can look back at this chart and specifically, I'm going to run the uh, that table. This is the table of values that goes into creating this chart. 
And I'll focus on the decision that I want to look at first. And that would be, let's look at peak uses. I've, I've written initial investment in my code, but I'm going to change that. Let's look at peak uses. So we'll notice that the peak uses varies. These are the values for decision one. And these are the values for decision two. Now, what this means, these are the net present values of the business model or the business case when peak uses is at its P 10th value. In other words, when the peak usage falls out at its low value, its low estimated value, this is the impact on the average business case value. When the initial peak or when the peak uses falls out its high value, this is the impact on the expected value of the business case. This, of course, is the P50. Now, I can take one and two, and I can reverse those, uh, or I can think of these as knowing that value beforehand, and I can create a combination of these three or these six values in such a way that represents knowing the outcome after knowing the uncertainties. So I'm going to create a full combination of spaces um, that represents the analog of rolling the decision tree, or rather looking at the decision tree in reverse, knowing the uncertainties first before I make the decision. The way I do this, um, I'm going to take, I, I'm sorry. I'm gonna go ahead and run these. And then I'm going to come back down to, now why am I not? All right. All right, this should run now. All right. Um, so you'll notice I've taken the, uh, this is for the initial investment. You'll notice that I've taken the values for the initial investment and for decision one, I've turned these so that they are now in columns, right? And repeated over three times because now I'm going to also take the same values for decision two and I'm going to turn these horizontally the way they are currently presented in this table. And if I lay both of these two tables on top of each other, this is essentially the same as looking at the full combination of all of the decision pathway values that could evolve. And I'm going to pick at each intersection of each tuple, the highest tuple value. And when I do that, that will give me this particular matrix. And this matrix represents of all of the decision pathways that could result, these are the values of the decisions that I choose that maximize the value on each decision pathway. Now I've got to invoke another little piece of magic here. I have a vector called the Swanson-McGill probabilities. And the Swanson-McGill probabilities are values 30, 40, 30. Um, these are rough rule of thumb values that allow you to take uh, P101050 values from a cumulative probability distribution, multiply them by those weights, the 30, 40, 30, and then calculate the expected value um, of that distribution roughly kind of right. I mean, it's close, it's not perfect, but it's kind of good enough to do an initial sort of scan of uh, for this value of information analysis. So I will apply each one of these probabilities to each decision point, and then I'll multiply them in, the, in sort of a full Cartesian multiplication. And that will give me this conditional probability matrix. Um, so you'll notice that 30, 40, 30, when you multiply this vector times itself in a matrix multiplication, we get this vector or this matrix. 
This represents the probabilities, the conditional probabilities at the end of each one of the decision pathways. And I now apply that probability at each tuple to the max decision matrix uh, on the associated tuple. And then I sum over the entire um, matrix. Uh, actually, multi make that multiplication together. Then I sum that over the entire matrix. Uh, and that gives me the number um, 1.74 million or so. Now, the value of information is not the value with prior information. In other words, if I were to make a decision moving forward, knowing how each uncertainty or the, the critical uncertainty itself would evolve, this is the value ultimately that I might experience looking forward. This would, it's the expected value of having all of the knowledge about that uncertainty before I make a decision. But the difference between that, that value with prior information, and the expected value uh, of the decision that maximizes value, uh, which we already know, if we go back, uh, I'll run the mean net present values again. Um, the decision two is the one with the highest net present value of the two. So the difference between these two values is the value of information. And uh, actually, I think I've already run that. But um, so in other words, this tells me that if I want to spend some money to get a better understanding of the initial investment, I should spend no more than 2.9 or about $3 million to get a finer understanding of that investment such that my decision is unambiguous. Now, of course, we're actually also concerned with peak uses. I'll come back up uh, to this particular point. Um, and then I'll rerun this section. And that's also uh, around $3 million or pounds in your case, I guess. Um, so around $3 million would be worth investing in the understanding the peak uses. So let's actually understand real clearly what this means. Before you make the decision to invest in this technology, you might think to yourself, well, I need to go out and do a broader population study or, or maybe in the case of more of a, uh, a private situation, a market analysis and you might be interested in hiring somebody to do that analysis, to go out and do the study. Uh, or maybe you think that there is a, um, uh, a an experiment that you could conduct, uh, a controlled experiment that would give you this information. Uh, in other words, knowing which level of peak uses is going to be the one that materializes. You would not want to spend any more than $3 million or 3 million pounds for that effort. You don't have to spend that much money, but if you do spend more than that amount, you've actually destroyed the value of the decision that maximizes the value. We want to spend less. So what this represents is the upper rational bound on the budget that we should be willing to pay to get more or higher quality information that makes us or allows us to make an unambiguous decision between the two decision pathways we have before us. All right. Um, so that's basically what is behind value of information. If I go back to my presentation notes, uh, this is where um, this brings us. I think as data scientists, um, myself included in this, we need to do a better job of atoning for our sins, right? And what I mean by that is that rather than focusing on just diving in and doing data analysis for its own sake, uh, even though we might think that it has a broader application than for its own sake, we need to do a better job of clarifying and framing the strategic alignment of the data analysis projects that we're working on. We need to ask ourselves, what are the strategic goals that a data science or a data analytic or a business case analytic uh, effort would help us to achieve? Um, from a data science perspective, if you're not necessarily looking at a business case analysis, you can still turn it into a business case analysis by asking yourself, if we had a particular insight, uh, let's say into the behaviors that knowing something about a system, 
if we know something about that system, what would it change at an operational level? If it changes something in the operational level, right, then it should have a measurable effect. And by the way, um, Douglas Hubbard's book, How to Measure Anything, is a great resource for understanding that. Um, you could then tie your data science projects back to actual operational business case value. Uh, and finally, um, or the last two points, of course, this should lead us then uh, as to focusing really on those business case or data analytics projects that ultimately have the possibility of creating real positive potential value uh, either to the organization or to the population they're intended to serve. Um, I really encourage people to sort of get out of the practice of just engaging in science fair projects and really looking at the business value or the operational or the social value that these projects can create uh, so that more people are actually served by value to the creation. And finally, the one last thing that this really does give you is that it moves you from just simply being an analyst. Uh, it moves you more into the planning seat, and it gives you the ability to sit at that planning table and have more uh, you know, influence and leverage on the overall budgeting process. Uh, it gives you more power in your organization to actually make changes with the type of analysis that you're interested in doing and that you're capable of doing. So that, I think, Mohammed brings me to sort of the end of the um, the material that I had uh, planned to present today. Um, oh, so absolutely uh, fantastic! Thank you so much. There are some questions. Thank you. Uh, sure. So, so I'll, I'll just read those out if I may. Uh, I'll ask colleagues to fill out their evaluation forms, uh, and um, in the meantime, the question one question is: um, I, I, somebody's just seeking clarity. Um, the mm -hmm. focus of the value of information analysis is was on the two vari variables which showed the widest range right. in the tornado. Is that the, the, the criteria by which we focus in? So actually, it's not just the widest range. It's actually the, the, uh, the overlap that exists between the two decisions on a given variable. So... There are actually some other candidates for doing the uh, the value of information in this case, rather than just the top two. The top two are really the most important. Uh, these are the ones that would cause you the, the most potential for heartburn, right? Or uh, happiness, depending on which way things swing. Um, but you can see that the cost of delivery also overlaps. Uh, the capitation rate overlaps. Uh, the time to peak overlaps. There, it's not a lot of overlap. Um, in fact, if I were to run the, let's say, time to peak, um, I'll run that one really quickly. Um, you'll see that it actually gives a very small value, about 21,000 um, currency units, dollars versus pounds, right? Um, so th that's probably not really worth spending a lot of time on. Uh, these uppers, the upper uh, two variables are really the most important, but really it's not so much the width, it's the it's the amount of overlap that exists or actually any overlap at all. Thank you, Rob, that's great. Uh, I think Stuart had some questions. Stuart, feel free to unmute and ask those questions while I scan the chat for any more questions. Hi, do you want me to verbalize them? Yes, please, I think that would be good, thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, it's a question about um, the, the requirement for an SME in the first place. Yes. On through the analysis process, do you then bring it back to the SME and say, do these look, results look sort of feasible to you? Absolutely. So one thing that I should emphasize about decision analysis, conducted properly, it's open-ended and iterative. It's a scientific process. It's a discovery process, right? So we're not just simply going to do a one-off analysis and then just move forward. We have to go back and iterate and make sure that um, the assessments that we've received are consistent, that the, uh, the SME continues to assert or that they, you know, um, uh, that they don't, aren't willing to change their minds, uh, that sort of anomalies don't arise out of the ranges give us that just don't make sense at all, you know, when we run the analysis. So there should always be a feedback loop. Okay, the, the second point was about the, um, 
the NHS, I mean, uh, part of my role is to look at the costing of our activity as well. So rather than looking sure. at the profit angle, we could look at the actual cost in terms of uh, patient level costs of providing treatments or not providing certain treatments. Sure. Might be a more, so, uh, an easier angle to sort of understand from the NHS analytical point of view. Well, so this is a good example of how doing values framing should be thought of. If your only concern is minimizing cost, you know, putting ranges on your cost, uh, understanding the, the uh, let's say the system or operational if process for how those costs are uh, realized and accrued, that's pretty simple. On the other hand, if you make changes to your system that affects those costs, it might actually affect the overall quality of the delivery that you make. Mm -hmm. So you would have to take that into account and you might have to then find a way to evaluate the effect on, let's say, quality of life experienced or the value of life. Now, I don't know if, if you guys are sort of allowed to do this in Britain, but uh, in the U.S., we very frequently do calculate the, the cost or the value of a life when we do these kinds of analyses. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a whole there's a whole another set of analytics based on health economics. Um, yes. Say nice guidelines to a large extent based on that. I mean, look, the day after Halloween, we're, it sounds a little ghoulish that we're putting a dollar value or a pound value on a person's life, but we, we live in a world of limited resources. And if we want to allocate resources so that the most are benefited, um, we have to make these kinds of decisions. These are hard decisions. I mean, I, I don't want to you know, minimize uh, their degree of difficulty and complexity. But somehow or another, we have to take that into account. And, uh, you know, the U.S. federal government uses a figure around $7 million per life. So when we do these kinds of health economic analyses or, let's say, um, national security analyses, you know, we look at the cost of a life. It's somewhere around $7 million. And then we look to minimize that cost of life. Yeah, it's a whole science in itself looking at sort of Affected life years and disability affected life years. That's um, right. You became, become, so I say it's a different, a yeah, whole different question. So looking at outcomes as well and perception of sort of everyone, if somebody says, okay, well, I'd like to have two months longer, how much are we going to pay for it? And right. down to propensity to spend. So it's a, a, a whole different different question. So the, the, the other part was about, well, the last thing was, what was the question? Um, Unit costs. Yeah, the actual rationale be before you even investigate a process, mm -hmm. do you need to be able to, rather, rather than sort of having a data scientist, because you've got a data scientist, do you, do you need to have approval to proceed further? So you do your sort of indicative analysis of, is, I could, is it worth investing six months of analytical time and doing a project on, on, an, on, a, on a concept? So you need to have a proof of concept before you go down to the, analytical route and do that so you, yeah actually the what i've described here could be used very quickly to do that right uh start off with a rough model of what you think the benefits are of doing the analysis um then of course uh you might have to compare that against other opportunities that are also vying for the same budgetary dollars um so i didn't go into that into this particular yeah. discussion today but you can actually calculate the marginal contribution of value for each of those alternative applications or allocations of resource, and then put them on a marginal curve, you know, uh, uh, based on the ordering by productivity index, which is the cost to implement versus the value created. Um, and then you actually get this sort of curve that moves up and flattens out. And you would tend to focus on those projects that uh, have the highest uh, slope on that curve and the ones that fit within your overall budget. Um, okay. So that would be one way of picking those out. Um, it, that's That takes a little bit more time to discuss as well, but that's just a real high level view of how to do that. Okay. No, no thank you very much, Rob. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, everybody. I think we've had a really, uh, a really interesting uh, and insightful presentation on decision analysis. It's certainly the first time um, for me to hear this at uh, the NSSR conference. So big thank you to our audience, but a very big thank you to, to Rob.
I'm going to. Oh, well, thank you. Recording. Pleasure is mine. I'm going to stop recording. But Rob, will you just hang on a moment if you can? But I'll stop recording now.